We started around Christmas 2017. I've never really known anyone who's played D&D, but I've always wanted to play it for myself. Such as, I had to learn on my own, and I had to teach it to other people. I ran my first D&D game for my girlfriend. It was a one-on-one, around Christmas. And it was pretty fun. It was so fun, in fact, that I tried playing a few more games, hoping one of my friends would become interested in replacing me as the de facto DM, but no such luck. For around half a year, I become the DM friend, and I start teaching my friends how to play D&D, and I run games for them. Life is good, but I still want to have an experience as a player. So around summer 2018, I decide to take a different approach. I go to a D&D Discord group. I'm in high school, so summer vacation gives me tons of time to find a group that I like, and play in a campaign consistently. For a few weeks, I mostly lurk around the Discord, stalking the GM Looking for Players channel a bit intimidated by the seriousness of all the games advertised. As it's my first time as a player, I'm looking for a group of fellow newbies who won't mind if I make mistakes here or there. First mistake. Eventually, I find someone running a game that fits my needs, to keep him anonymous. Let's call him Craig. He's looking for someone to join an ongoing campaign, someone who's preferably experienced with roleplaying, as other players seem a bit shy when it comes to roleplaying. Being that I'm a fairly outgoing person and I already have experience with online role playing boards, I decide to hop right in. I message Craig, I ask him what type of character would fit the party best, and I eventually come up with Russo Warkiller, a hobgoblin artificer princess. Russo is going to end up being a blast, but that's a story for another thread. After turning in my character sheet, he invites me to the Discord group and tells me we were going to be playing on Saturday. I'm excited. I spend the entire week perfecting my character and the day eventually comes that we all hop into voice chat to play. I say hi and immediately I'm relieved. The three other people in the voice chat being Craig and two other players, let's call them Dave and Keith, sound younger than I am. For reference, I was 17 at the time and they all sound very shy and, well, nerdy. Being that I'm an outgoing, charismatic person, I immediately start chatting with them. Craig, who I'd never spoken to out of text until now. Turns out to curse like a sailor. I don't have a problem with cursing. But it seems that every sentence this guy says seems to have at least one fuck or a variation of fuck. But overall, he's alright. Dave is the second person who replies to me. He's a very serious person. And you can tell he's probably the eldest one out of the three. I asked him who his character is. And he tells me he's playing Icarus. A storm cleric who's trying to save his boyfriend Apollo. Or something. Yes, that Apollo. He worships Greek gods. The last person to say anything is Keith. He's pretty funny, but incredibly quiet. Stereotypical nerdy guy. He's playing an optimised rogue slash ranger half-elf named Adrian. And he seems to be more into the war game aspect of D&D. Whenever he roleplays, which is quite rarely, he does it in chat. I think because he's embarrassed to roleplay in front of his parents, given that he uses his living room computer. So we start playing. As I previously mentioned, I joined the campaign midway, meaning the players were already doing something. In this case, the session picks off with Adrian and Icarus on the verge of leading an army against the main bad guy's army, deliberate some generic D&D town. They do so painstakingly. Craig insistent on using this weird army on army combat system he made up, and it is the most boring thing I have ever had to sit through. No role playing, no characters doing anything. Just an interaction, more or less like this. Craig, your valley is being attacked on three fronts. You have 900 soldiers. Where do you want to distribute your troops? Keith, after five minutes of silence. Uh, I guess 300 on each flank. Followed by shit you not. 30 minutes of pure rolling by the DM, with occasional updates on our army's HP, morale, and other arbitrary numbers that we don't care about. No one is Indian, and you can tell. Dave is absolutely silent, hoping Keith will deal with the whole thing, and Keith goes AFK at one point because of how boring it is. I sit through the whole thing, still excited to begin with my character. Eventually, party and soldiers manage to liberate Genericville, and the party moves in to report to the Lord about their whole quest. But before this, they stop on by the Adventurers Guild, go on a little side quest to recruit Russo involving a battle tournament, and we end the session for the night. Not too bad so far, right? Well, that was just an introduction. The story I'm about to tell happens a few sessions later. To bring you up to speed, 
The party moved from town to town, piecing together clues on the big bad, and we deciphered that he was trying to construct the Dark Spire, a magical tower that could grant the builders unlimited wishes. Our quest brings us to the edge of the continent, and we were told that the secret to defeating the big bad is held in a temple across the sea, in a whole other continent. We recruit a few more players along the way, including a cat girl sorcerer named Nia. Wasn't actually called Nia, but I cannot for the life of me remember what she was actually called, and a tabaxi monk named Snow. We purchase a ship and travel across the sea. Eventually we make it to the other continent, and Craig says, you guys see some fireworks as you approach the coastline. There's probably a festival happening today. Obviously a plot hook, but we decide to go with it. Russo, who had been tinkering with making an animatronic pegasus for Icarus, suggested to head to town to purchase a few supplies for her pegasus and enjoy the festival. For a moment, I was hoping that this session would be some fun, role-playing heavy carnival hijinks. I was wrong. As we dock, the first thing we see is an old man. He stops us on the way to town and tells us about the festival. Today, every kid in the continent turns 13 and they get their grimoire, a source of magical power. Except Yami. Yami's a piece of shit. Immediately, I think two things. A. Does this mean every child on the continent is born at exactly the same time? B. Can this guy get any more obvious about this plot hook? We tell him that's cool and all, but we need to buy supplies. The NPC tells us that we can't go into the festival because we're outsiders. We can't purchase supplies because the shops are closed. And the only thing we can do is go into the Orphanage slash Adventurers Guild. Yes, the Orphanage also serves as the Adventurers Guild. Where Yami just happens to be located. I roll my eyes and we all head inside the Orphanage. This is where it gets good. Once inside, the DM describes a child that looks exactly like the related pick. Black spiky hair, 13 years old, wearing jeans and a t-shirt. Yes, in D&D. And he seems to be moping around. The party heads over to him and asks him what's wrong. Yami tells us that he's the only child on the continent that can't use magic. And as such, he didn't receive his grimoire. The party kind of feels bad for him, so we all try and cheer him up, explaining how you don't need to use magic to be powerful. Each party member gives a frankly heartwarming account of how they rely on things that aren't magic. Snow says he's gotten strong, and that's how he's powerful. Rosie says she's made incredible artifacts with science and research, and we all try to cheer him up. Yami stays silent for a few seconds. Yami. 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 I still wish I had my grimoire. I'm useless. Okay, so our stories were shot down. The orphanage manager, who just happens to be the same old man we saw at the docks, asks us to go find his grimoire, but the party has other plans. Rosie? being an incredibly motherly character and deciding that the kid is pretty cute, asks him if she can adopt him and gets rejected multiple times. Each time, the old man just insists on us finding the grimoire. Eventually, this gets pretty funny. So the whole party joins in on the insisting until the point that the DM loses it. He stays silent for a minute and then asks us in an extremely exasperated voice if we can just agree to find the grimoire. No, we all say in unison. So he snaps and agrees to let us adopt Yami if we find the grimoire. We agree, and Rosie immediately starts being a mama hen to Yami, telling him to stay in the boat with the animatronic servant she constructed, and not get in the inevitable danger of combat. Reluctantly, Yami agrees, and he stays in the ship. With that, we decide to go find the grimoire. Adrian activates a spell that helps us know when the grimoire is close, and we all follow him out of the city, through the continent, in a trip that takes a number of days. After a brief time skip, we're less than five miles away from the grimoire, and we find a bandit camp nestled in a valley. It must be there. Excitedly, the party ducks behind a mountain, completely out of view from the bandits, who couldn't see us anyway, given that we were five miles away from them, and we start making battle plans. Up until that moment, the DM hadn't really given us any opportunities to sneak around, so we've all been waiting for this moment. Adrian decides to enchant our horse-sized dragon with a major invisibility, and we all hop up on the dragon, therefore making us invisible, given the dragon is technically wearing us. Our planning goes on for a few minutes, until the DM interrupts us, saying, You hear a voice coming from the bandit camp, saying, We can hear you, you know. We tell them to shut up, and start making an attack plan instead. For some reason they can hear us from five miles away but we still have the upper ground. 
This goes on for a few minutes more until the DM interrupts us again by saying, Okay, the bandits snap their fingers and you're all teleported into their camp. That's fine. A bit bullshit that we don't get to do any saves against that, but it's fine. Each of us pull out our weapons ready to fight, but the bandit leader, who is described as a holographic being of pure magic, snaps his fingers again, and we're wrapped in magical chains, immobilised. No problem, I'm an artificer, and I know Rossi has a magical item that can repair this, but as soon as I say I reach for one of my tools, the DM tells me I'm paralysed from the waist down. Our monk tries to teleport us out, he can't because his monk powers don't work. Our rogue tries to lockpick the chains, there's no lock. It slowly dawns on us that this is something we can't fight. So we ask, is there anything we can do? Nope, says the DM. Alright, fine. By this point, we've been railroaded into a quest that makes no sense. We didn't even want to take, and we're now paralysed and teleported without a chance to fight back. We're all done with Craig at this point, so we just start asking the bandits to kill us, insulting them all the while. The bandits laugh and draw their weapons, monologuing on why they stole the grimoire and how they hate Yami. And then Yami appears. Now think of it. Yami got past a combat made golem and managed to follow us without supplies throughout the continent with no combat skills, magic, survival skills or otherwise. This kid managed to follow us and avoid detection with only the clothes in his back and now he's shown up at the best possible time our very own deus ex machina. But of course, given that he's unarmed and powerless, he can only manage to call out our names before one of the bandits smack him into the ground. He begins to insult Yami, drawing a weapon ready to execute the poor boy. He's helpless, beaten down, worthless. It's an anime moment, isn't it? Of course it is! All at once the party understands that the only way we're going to get through this is through the power of God and anime on Yami's side. We all start cheering him on like this was Dragon Ball, yelling, You can do it, Yami! Despite that logically, he is very much dead. And after we encourage him enough, Craig says this, Yami struggles up, and a black sword materialises in his hand. The bandit says, T- This can't be! Yami raises his sword and yells out, Anti-magic pulse! The chains disappear, and he begins to cut down all of the magical bandits with his anti-magic sword. So, Yami kills all the bandits, saves us all, saves his grimoire, and takes us back to the city. This entire session, we essentially did nothing. We arrived at a city and went on a pointless quest that could have been solved by an NPC, and where we contributed nothing. And that's where the story should have ended, shouldn't it? The campaign ended a few months ago, a few weeks ago. I was telling my friend this very story. He's a weeaboo, just like Craig, and the moment I described Yami to him, he gets a strange glint in his eyes. He asked me to describe Yami to him, and I do. He asked me if he had a black sword, and I tell him he did. He asked me if he had a grimoire, and I tell him he did. And that's the exact name the DM used for it. With a smile, my friend produced his phone, and tells me to hold up while he googles something. Then he shows me a wiki article for an anime called Black Clover the protagonist of which is an anti-magic using, sword wielding, 16 year old, spiky haired anime kid who pictures look exactly like the DM's description of Yami. So too long didn't read. Don't make your players feel useless in your plot and if you are, don't rip off an anime doing it. And if you're going to do those two things, can you at least make it so that all of this fits in with the D&D universe?